Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing in the previous uh, two lectures that we have discussed about the electrophoresis, the basic principle as well as we have also discussed about the how to perform the uh, electrophoresis and subsequently in the previous lecture we have also discussed about once you got the uh, image then you can do the lot of analysis with the help of different types of software which are available and in a detailed demo what we have shown in the last uh, lecture that how the software can be able to help you in terms of analyzing that particular image and the, how that analysis can help you to answer many questions. So, in the today's lecture we are, uh, we are going to discuss about how once you are done with the image analysis how what are the different information you will get from that image and how that information can let you to characterize the proteins which we are going to purify using the SDS page. So, the first thing what we have to discuss is the image what you have got and how that image can be used to answer many questions. So, apart from the uh, SDS page, you have different variants of the uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So, uh, we have the uh, SDS page which we have discussed in the previous two lectures where we were using the uh, SDS as a denaturating agents and in, in addition to the SDS we were also using the beta macaptoethanol and both of these denaturating agents were destroying the three dimensional structure of the proteins and also the beta macaptoethanol is breaking the disulfide linkages. So, uh, and on the other hand the SDS is also providing the negative charge to the protein. So, because of that when you are performing the SDS page uh, as we have discussed in the previous lecture that the electrophoretic mobility is directly proportional to the charge by the mass. But if within the SDS page if you are using the SDS which is actually going to give the negative charge to the protein. Uh, the charge portion is going to be the equal uh, for all the proteins and as a result what will happen is when you perform the SDS page the protein first of all the protein three dimensional structure is going to be broken down. The second the protein is going to have the all the proteins are going to have the equal negative charge and as a result the proteins are going to migrate based on their molecular weight which means the protein which is of higher molecular weight is going to run slower and the protein which is going to be of lower molecular weight is going to run faster because the electrophoretic mobility is inversely proportional to the mass of that particular protein. But if you do not allow or you do not add the SDS as well as the beta metcryptoethanol in those cases the protein is going to have its intrinsic charge, the protein is going to maintain the three dimensional conformations and that particular type of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is called as the native page. So, SDS page discussed uh, uh, is, is using uh, an ionic detergent sodium uh, sodium dual sulfate and bitter capitalol to give equal charge to all the protein and breaks the disulfide linkages. As a result, the three dimensional structure of the protein is destroyed and it migrate as per their subunit molecular weight. Whereas, in the native page, the sample is prepared in the loading dye does not contain detergent or the denaturating agent and as a result, the sample runs on the basis of charge by mass 
which means the electrophoretic mobile since the, all the proteins are going to have different types of charges either the positive charge or the negative charge and then it also going to have the different types of masses. So, whatever the ratio uh, uh, will come the electrophoretic mobility will be directly proportional to the charge by mass ratio and that is why in native page the three dimensional conformation as well as the activity of the protein remains unaffected which means the native proteins or the native gel or the native SDS pa native page is going to retain the three dimensional conformation of the protein as well as it is going to retain the activity of that particular protein. What that mean is that if you uh, if you would like to study the, the activity of a particular protein and if you want to uh, judge the, the or you want to characterize your protein based on that particular activity, then you can run the protein in the native page and then you can do the activity staining and that will actually give you the answer whether the protein which you have purified and the purified product what you have uh, got after the uh, recombinant DNA technology whether that particular protein or the factor is uh, catalytically active or not. On the other hand, the three dimensional conformation is also going to be retained. So, if you can uh, modulate or if you modulate the conditions you could be able to answer whether the protein is maintaining the native conditions or not. The other uh, variant is the urea page. In this method, the insoluble protein is dissolved in urea and the sample is separate based on their charge by mass ratio. A gradient urea is used to monitor the folding state of a protein. So, urea as you know is a denaturating agent. Uh, mechanism of urea is very much different from the denaturating mechanism of SDS. So, in case of SDS page, the SDS is going to destroy the three dimensional conformations and as well as it is going to give the negative charge. Whereas, in the case of urea, it is actually going to destroy the three dimensional conformations, but it is not going to give any negative charge. So, as a result, even in the, in the presence of urea, the protein is going to run as per their charge by mass ratio which means the protein are still going to run as per their charge by mass ratio and that actually is have an advantage that in the presence of urea you could be able to monitor how the three dimensional conformation of a protein is uh, is eff getting affected if you add the different amount of urea and that is how actually you if you run the urea page you can be able to use that particular page to monitor the protein folding or the unfolding kinetics. Now, let us move on to the application. So, in the previous two lectures, we have discussed how to run the page and how to analyze the image. Now, we are going to discuss what is the application of the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So, one and the foremost uh, application of the SDS page is that it will allow you to calculate the subunit molecular weight of a protein. How to do that? So, if you want to use the SDS page to determine the molecular weight of a protein, what you are supposed to do is you resolve the protein sample on a SDS page along with the molecular weight markers. So, molecular weight marker is a kind of a recipe which you are going to get from the many biochemical or many biochemistry uh, uh, companies what what the molecular weight marker is that it is a mixture of the different protein which they mix and that is how it is actually predecided that which molecule which protein band is going to be of which molecular weight which means it is actually the standard protein which they mix and that is how you know what is the molecular weight corresponding to which band. For example, in this case we have the different types of bands which we are going to use and all these molecular weight markers the protein which are present in the molecular weight marker we already know what is the um, what is the mass of this particular uh, band and what is the mass of the other band. So, because you know already you can use that to drive a calibration curve. So, once you are done with the resolution of uh, resolving the samples on the SDS page along with the molecular weight marker, what you are going to do is you are going to calculate the relative mobility RF using the formula RF is equivalent to the migration of a protein from the lane which means from here uh, versus the migration of 
the tracking die. So, you can see that the tracking die we have taken a marker. So, this is the place until which the tracking die is running. Suppose for this particular pro band we are would like to calculate the RF value. So, what we are going to do is we are going to run a, a, a line through the middle of that particular band and then we are going to measure the distance. So, that is the uh, that is the top value and then we are go also going to calculate the distance of the die front and uh, if you divide these two values you are going to get the RF value for this particular band. Similarly, you can do the RF value for the D1, you can do for D2, you can do for D3, you can do for D4 and then you can for do, do for D5. Similarly, you have to do the RF value for the sample band as well. Remember, when you see a band, normally you see a band like this, okay, as you can see here. So, many times the students were always having a, a confusion through what, what should I take the point for this particular protein. So, in those kind of cases, you have the approach either you take the center of this particular band and you measure the values or the best approach is that you take the value from top and then you take the value from the bottom and then you can use the average RF value or average distance of these two. So, you can measure a distance from the point number 1, you can measure a distance from the point number 2 and whatever the distance you are getting, you can just make the average of that and that actually is going to give you the, uh, give you the RF value with the minimum error possible. Although it is always advisable when you would like to use the SDS page for the calculation of molecular weight, you should load very little amount of protein so that it should form a band which is of thin layer and which should not have any thickness because if you load very large quantity of the protein, then it is going to form a, a band like this and that actually is going to create trouble because then you will be confused whether I should take this as a uh, point to measure the RF value or whether I should take a point here to calculate the RF value or whether I should take a middle uh, line or middle point in this particular band and either of these situation are going to give you some amount of error that is why it is uh, recommended that you load very little amount of protein so that it should just form a very very thin line or with thin band actually onto the SDS page. So, once you are calculated the RF value for the marker proteins, you have calculated the RF value for your sample, then what you do is you plot the log molecular weight versus relative mobility on the of the standards. So, what you are going to get, you are going to get the RF versus the log molecular weight and you are going to get a negative uh, calibration curves. Then you uh, use the linear uh, linear regression equations to estimate the mass of the unknown protein. So, you know the RF value of your own protein and that is actually you can use to calculate the mole molecular weight of the uh, protein which you would like to uh, calculate the molecular weight. So, then you can use the RF value of your unknown sample and you can be able to calculate the molecular weight. As I said, one of the thing is that you can have the band like this but when you can actually encounter many different types of abnormalities in running of these bands or in running or resolve, uh, when you are resolving your sample onto the STS page and that actually going to give you different types of error when you are calculating the molecular weight or any other kind of analysis. So, uh, what are the different types of uh, uh, troubleshooting or what are the different types of bands what you are going to see onto the SDS page and how you can overcome those problems. So, one of the thing is called as a smiley bands. So, uh, even uneven heating of the gel causes differential migration of the protein with the outer lanes the rapid heating transfer eliminate this effect and can be achieved by filling the whole tank with the buffer until the sample right. So, what is mean by the smiley is that you have a band like this or you can have the band like this. What happen is that the, the corners are actually running either slower or either running the faster. In, in the case of that the corners are running faster, you are going to have the uh, the uh, different types of smiley 
or if you are running the slower the you are going to get the different types of smiley and all these pro these smiley effects are going to create trouble in terms of analyzing the that particular band also to calculate the rf values how to correct that what you can and this what why this happens this happened because when you are running this sample on the plates you are actually having the uneven heating onto this plate and because of this heating the the wells uh, either, uh, either the protein is running faster or the protein is running slower and all the protein molecules are not running uniformly and because of that it is going to create a, a smiley like appearance so you have to ca you have to bring the uh, coolness in the system so what you can do is you can have the rapid heat transfer will eliminate this effect and it will be achieved simply by filling that lower tank with the buffer until the sample height which means you know that if you re re remember there was a buffer tank uh, during the SDS page uh, so you can just fill this buffer tank slightly more so that the buffer which you are which you which is present is actually going to maintain the uniform heat and it is going to maintain the uh, SDS page plates slightly cool and you can actually recycle this uh, buffer as well if you are seeing that if you seeing that the uh, the protein is getting heating or your your apparatus is getting heat very high then you can actually exchange the buffer or you can uh, uh, put it into the ice bags so that you will be the buffer which is which you are filling outside should be very cooled the second is the diffuse protein bands so diffuse pattern of the protein band appear on the page the diffused protein bands pattern can be corrected simply by increasing the uh, the running current by 25 to 50 percent higher correction or you can have the higher concentration of the acclamide so diffusing protein bands are like you are going to have a some kind of streak then you have the vertical streak which means the protein are going to be like present in a, in a streak format which means it they are not going to be present in a very very concise area which means instead of this they are not going to be present as a band they are going to have a streak so these vertical streaks uh, or vertical streak of a protein band appear due to the overloading of the protein sample if you remember in the previous lecture we have discussed that when you load a sample it has to be stacked properly but if you load large quantity of the protein what will happen is before the last molecule of the protein is going to be stacked it the first molecule will start migrating or start resolving and because of that uh, the uh, the some molecules are going to run slightly ahead of the all other molecule and because of that you are going to have a vertical streak how it can be corrected it can be corrected either by reducing the amount of the protein sample or running the gel at a lower current so if you run the lower amount of protein all the protein molecules will get stacked or if you run the protein at a very lower uh, current it will allow the protein molecules to get stacked because then the electrophoretic mobility is going to be very low when they are running into the stacking gel and that is how it, they will get enough time to get stacked. Then uh, protein runs faster than expected in few cases migration of a protein is not proportional to the molecular weight it is either more or less on the gel than the expected place why it is happened it is it is due to the unusual very high proportion of basic or acidic amino acids so if you remember we said that if you adding the sds to the protein uh, proteins are not going to have protein are going to have the equal charge and because of that the protein are now going to run simply by their molecular weight which means the electrophoretic mobility will be inversely proportional to the molecular weight but what is in observed that in some cases the protein runs either faster or the slower and in those cases what people have found that the protein is either having the large quantity of acidic protein uh, acidic uh, uh, amino acids and because of the acidic amino acid the protein is also having the negative charge from the SDS the protein is also going to have uh, negative charge because of the acidic amino acids and this acidic amino acid actually give them the more electrophoretic mobility what it is supposed to be whereas in some cases it is actually contains 
the basic amino acids and in those cases the net negative charge is less compared to the all other protein and because of that it runs slower compared to the molecular weight. Uh, then you have the double bands, the appearance of a double band is due to the partial oxidation or degradation of your protein bands. So, sometime what you see is you see like two bands which are appearing very close to each other and these are called as the double bands. Uh, well, how to correct that? You can add the more amount of reducing reagent or preparing a fresh sample with reduce these uh, double band artifacts. Then you have the distorted protein bands. Appearance of a distorted or uneven protein band is due to the stacking gel polymerization. It can be corrected by increasing the amount of ammonium persulfate and timid or de uh, aeration of the stacking gel. So, sometime what happen is the protein is forming the distorted protein band and that is happening because it is when it is resolving through the stacking gel, the stacking gel polymerization is not good and because of that the protein bands are distorted. So, to correct that you have to add more amount of timid and APS so that the polymerization should be uniform and polymerization should be correct for the stacking gel or what you can do is you can also remove the air from the stacking gel solution. So, when you do the degassing of the stacking gel the polymerization also going to be better compared to the previous conditions. Then we have the lateral spreading. Lateral spreading is that if the protein bands appear laterally spreading, which means suppose this is your lane, the protein is spreading like this. Okay, so it is spreading throughout uh, outside the lane actually. So it can be avoided by the reducing the uh, time between the loading of the sample and running. So what happens is why it happens when you load the samples, it starts dis uh, diffusing. So, when you load the sample it goes and sit into the lane, but if you take very long amount large amount of time to connect it to the power pack and turning on the power then the bands are started diffusing like this. So, suppose you load it into the well and you, it, 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 they are sitting here then, then they start uh, like this uh, diffusing like this and because they already diffused some amount once you turn on the power these diffused bands or diffused proteins are also started resolving and then they actually does not come closer to each other and then that is how they are getting the, uh, the lateral spreading of this particular protein bands. How to correct that? You have to correct by simply by loading the protein and then turning on as quickly as possible. Now, let us move on to the next application. So, the next application is that suppose you have produced a protein then you can also determine the oligomeric status of that, that, that particular protein. What is mean by the oligomeric status is that it is actually going to tell you that how many number of monomers or how many number of subunits are present in that particular protein. So, for example, if suppose a protein has two subunits A and B or it can be AA. So, this is called as heterodimer, this is called as homodimer. So, this is the dimer which means the two subunits are present. So, these two subunits could be two different subunits A and B or it could be one subunit but present in the two copies AA like that. Similarly, you can have the uh, trimers. So, you can have three units like 1, 2 and 3 or you can have the tetramers. Uh, one of the classical example for the tetramer is the hemoglobin where you have the 2 alpha chains and 2 beta chains. So, if you are making the hemoglobin into the uh, into the E. coli expression system then and suppose you are making the hemoglobin as a substitute for the blood transport or blood transfusion, then it is important for you that you should correct and you should verify that the 2 alpha and 2 beta what you have produced into the, into the E. coli and that has given you a tetrameric hemoglobin. Uh, should be a tetrameric hemoglobin. It should not be dimer, it should not be monomer. So, you have correct, you have produced alpha subunits, you have produced the beta subunits, then they get mixed together in the E. coli and that is how you are going to have the tetramer. And you can use the SDS page to determine 
whether all the four subunits are present in your molecule as well or not. So, what you do is you purify this particular protein. So, suppose I have purified the hemoglobin which I have produced the in, in the E. coli expression system and then what I will do is I will run this hemoglobin in two conditions. One I will use the native conditions and the other one I will use in the denaturating SDS space conditions. So, what will happen is the, when I run it on the native conditions, it is going to give me, me a protein uh, and then, then I will calculate the molecular weight in both the conditions. I will calculate when it is in the native conditions, it will give me a molecular weight of 64 kilo Dalton. When it is in the SDS page, I will get two bands of 15 or 16 kilo Dalton. Uh, because alpha and beta subunits are 15 kilo Dalton. So, I am going to get two bands and I can calculate the molecular weight of these two bands which are corresponding to the alpha and beta subunits. And uh, if that happens, then what you do is and you want to calculate the oligomeric status, what you have to do is oligomeric status is equivalent to the cal to molecular weight what you got into the native page divided by the molecular weight you got into the STS page. So, if I divide this number by the 15 and this number what I will get is I will get the 4 which means 64 divided by 16 which is going to give me the 4. But that means is that I have produced the hemoglobin which actually contains 2 alpha and 2 beta and that is how it is actually showing a oligomeric status of 4. And since we have already verified on the SDS page that you are getting two bands, one is of 15 kilo Dalton, another one is 17 kilo Dalton, which is actually the average of 16. So, that is how you are actually confirming that the hemoglobin what you have produced in the E. coli expression system is of good quality and it is actually uh, uh, ma maintaining the similar oligomeric status. You can go further ahead and do some more characterization experiments to prove that the your hemoglobin what you have produced in E. coli is carrying the oxygen and that we can discuss in the later lectures. So, a protein what you are going to do when you are doing the oligomeric status, the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis can be used to determine the oligomeric status of the protein. A protein sample can be run under the denaturating as well as under the native conditions in two separate gels. The protein of the known molecular weight runs on both the gel and the RF value is calculated for the standard protein as we discussed in the previous slide. A calibration curve from the native and the denaturating is used to determine the molecular weight in the native as well as denaturating conditions and the oligomeric status of the protein is calculated from the formula that is oligomeric status is the molecular weight in the native conditions divided by the molecular weight from the denaturating conditions. Now, uh, just now uh, as we discussed about the urea page. So, urea page is what you can use to monitor the folding or the unfolding kinetics of an unknown protein. So, it is important because when you produced a protein, you want to know that the stability of this proteinaceous factor is as good as it was reported in the literature. So, when you want to see the stability factor, you also have to do a unfolding kinetics. And for doing unfolding kinetics, you can do a urea gel. Urea, uh, gel. So, in the urea gel, is a typical, in a typical urea gel experiments, what you do is protein is exposed to the different concentration of urea and then what will happen is the urea is going to interact with the amino acid residues and that is how it is going to denature the protein and uh, that can be monitored by the spectroscopic or the gel filtration techniques. Unfolding of a protein causes an increase in the hydrodynamics volume of the protein and it results in the slower mobility in polyacrylamide gels. In the urea page, a polyacrylamide gel is prepared with a horizontal gradient of urea which means you are going to prepare a horizontal gradient which means the this lane is going to have the 0 urea, this is going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 molar urea. Now, the question comes how you are you can be able to cast this particular type of gel. 
the way you we normally cast the gel is like this right we fill uh, we fill the uh, resolving gel like this then we fill the stacking gel so it will be always in the vertical condition but for the urea page you have to have a gradient which is going to be from this direction to this direction which means i have to cast a gel from this direction to this direction which means i have to be in the different uh, orientations for the way the people do normally in to cast these gels is what they do is they just rotate this particular cassette completely so what you do is first you rotate this by 90 degree okay so in that case it is going to be like this and then what you do is you seal this particular side as well with a glass slide okay so what i have done is i have rotated this cassette like this and then i have sealed this side as well with a glass plate okay and now what i am doing is i am putting a urea of different concentration so i have first put normal acrylamide which is zero urea then i have put one molar urea then i have put two molar urea then i have put four like that and then we have completed the eight molar urea and the whole casting is over so i have not put the stacking gel so far i have just simply put the resolving gel with containing the different amount of urea once the resolving gel is over then i have moved this and rotated again then it becomes like this like in a in in a vertical direction and containing the urea like that and then i have what i have done is i have removed this glass blockage i have put stacking gel and then i have resolved my samples and the samples are already containing the different amount of urea so you have incubated your sample in different amount of urea what urea will going to do is urea is going to open the structures and as a result the the molecular surface area of those molecules or the protein molecule is going to be higher and as you seen in the in the previous lecture also we have discussed that you one side if you have a molecule uh, on one side it is actually being uh, carried by the electrophoretic mobility on the other side it is going to be friction so uh, this side it is electrophoretic mobility on the other reverse side it is the friction so once the structure is getting getting opened the frictional forces are going to be on a higher side which means the pro if the protein if, if you don't have the friction the protein may be getting uh, immobilized here because at this point the frictional forces as well as the electrophoretic forces are equal but if you increase the frictional forces what will happen is the bands are start going to be immobilized on a slightly on a higher side because they will not they are, they will they are now losing the uh, the electrophoretic mobility and because of that you could be able to see if the protein is getting unfolded so you will see that the band is going up and up and like that and that is what is happening the same protein sample is loaded in different lanes and it is allowed to run vertically perpendicular to the urea gradient as sample runs in different lanes it get exposed to the different concentration of urea and consequently at a particular urea concentration the protein is unfolded with an increase in hydrodynamic volume okay and at that point the frictional forces will go up right that is what you see the native protein are running like uh, uh, running more and the unfolded protein will migrate slower due to the increase in frictional forces and it gives a unique protein bands to a uh, to provide a qualitative or semi qualitative information about the protein folding intermediate so what you see is that initially it got folded so it, this is actually like 0 1 2 3 4 so when it reaches to four molar urea some portion of the protein got unfolded and that's how it has created a increased hydrodynamic volume and now the this will remain intact but when you reaches to the 5 molar some more portion got opened and once you reaches to the 6 molar the full protein got unfolded and that it still remain like that so that's how at 6 molar urea you the this particular protein got completely folded and 
the information from the gradient urea pH needs further verification from the other analytical techniques. So, the information what you get from the urea pH is actually the semi qualitative or semi quantitative or observatory kind of information which means it is going to give you the information that up to the 4 molar urea the pro this protein structure is very stable, but when you go to the 5 molar or 6 molar the protein structure is going to be disrupted and that information is, is good enough to establish few more uh, concluding experiment using the some other analytical techniques such as CD spectroscopy or fluorescence spectroscopy. So, to answer more questions what is opening whether it is a domain which is opening or whether it is a, uh, some more subunits which are getting detached from this particular protein. So, you can imagine that if it is a monomeric protein you will see this particular type of pattern. If it is a dimeric protein you what you will see is that the monomer is uh, getting like this then the you will see more bands appearing like the two bands, three bands like that. If you have a tetramer, you will see once the, all the protein got denatured, you will see the four bands because all the four bands are going to be separated from each other and all the four bands are going to migrate at a different relative uh, mobility. So, this uh, urea page uh, in addition to the protein folding, urea page can also be used to analyze the protein complexes as well as the covalent heterogeneity of the protein. Uh, then the SDS page can also be used to study the protein protein interactions. Protein protein interaction can be studied in two different approaches. In approach 1, protein A and B is incubated in an in vitro reaction to form the complex B. Now the formation of the complex AB can be analyzed on a native page as as you can see in this particular figure. So, protein A is of 30 kilo Dalton, protein B is of 40 kilo Dalton and what you see is that it is formed a complex of 70 kilo Dalton, but what you see is that the electrophoretic mobility is not in proportion to the 70 kilo Dalton because it is actually running based on the charge by mass because we are running a uh, native page ok. So, it is not like 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 because the masses are being added, but subsequent uh, in, in addition to that the charges are also being mixed with each other and because of that you do not know or the resulting charge by it will migrate as per the resulting charge by mass ratio. So, that it will give you a distinct band, but it will not be in proportion to the mass because the masses are it is actually migrating based on the charge by mass ratio because we are running a native page. Uh, once the complex is formed there will be a shift of the band in the position in compared to the individual protein bands. Now, in the approach to uh, the protein in the approach to in the protein A is, is going to be resolved onto the STS page and then you transferred it onto the nitrocellulose membrane. So, you have resolved the protein A which is onto the gel, then you transfer this onto a membrane. So, you have got transferred. Now, this protein band is going to be blocked with the 1 percent VSA overnight at 4 degree uh, and then you add the nitrocellulose membrane, you incubate that with the protein B overnight at 4 degrees. So, what you do is you add the BSA for blocking agent and in that blocking agent itself you add the protein B. So, if the protein B has a affinity for protein A, the protein B will go and bind to the protein A. Then what you do is you wash and now you add the anti B antibodies which means you are going to add the antibodies which is against this uh, protein B. Uh, the membrane is washed with the buffer and probed with the NTB antibodies followed by the HRP coupled secondary antibodies. The blot is developed by the DAB. So, what will happen is if the B is interacting with the A, it will be uh, and then it will be detected by the NTB antibodies and as a result what you will see is you will going to see the band at the position where the A is present. In this particular type of approach what you have to take a precaution is that you have to run a control gel where the A this particular transfer thing is also going to be probed with NTB. 
so that you should ensure that the antibodies what you are using for detecting the protein B is not cross reacting with the protein A because in those cases what will happen is that you will get the signal irrespective of whether the protein B is interacting with A or not. Then you can also use that particular thing is for detecting the glycoprotein and the phosphoproteins. So you can run the protein samples and stain with the different reagents to specifically detect the glycoprotein and with the phosphoprotein. For example, you can use the PASS reagent, the periodic acid shift reagents specifically to stain with the glycoprotein whereas the phosphorylated protein can be detected by labeling with the P32 followed by the autoradiography. Now we will discuss about the western blotting. So one of the uh, one of the western blotting is a very very robust and the popular techniques to detect the protein what you have produced is actually the good or bad. So that can be done by two methods, two ways. In one way what you have is you are producing a protein which is actually containing a tag. So if you remember when we were discussing about the affinity chromatography we have put a tag actually. So remember that we have the antihist tag okay, to this protein. So what we can do is we can use the antibodies for the tag for example we can use the anti his antibodies. Similarly it could be also possible that you do not have the tag but the protein what you are producing should also have the antibodies. So the prime requirement of this particular approach is that you should have the antibodies to detect the protein which you would like to characterize because that will that will be the used as an analytical tool in this particular technique. So western blotting is a popular technique to detect the specific protein present in the crude lysate or the homogenate. It uses the separation of different protein in the gel electrophoresis like SDS page and then the transfer of protein onto the solid support such as the nitrocellulose membrane. So what you are going to do is first you trans run the gel on the gel then you transferred it onto the nitrocellulose membrane then you incubate with the primary antibodies then you wash them to remove the secondary antibody uh, to primary antibodies and then you incubate it with the secondary antibodies and then you develop with the different types of developing agents. A primary antibody direct against the protein of interest so it could be anti his antibodies or the antibody which you have detected for the your uh, protein of your interest. And then secondary antibody is used to detect the primary antibody and give you either color or the chemiluminescent signals. But the western blotting is a very very uh, complicated as well as the multi step techniques. So all these steps has to be done in a very very good accordance. So what is the material you need for doing the western blotting? You have to have E. coli which is over expressing in this case we have taken an example of GFP. Then you need a protein standard, then you need a transfer buffer, then you need a transfer membrane. Transfer membrane could be the 0.4 micron meter nitrocellulose membrane or the PVDF membrane. Uh, then you need a plastic tray, you need a spatula, you need a blotting sheets which are actually 3 mm thick cellulose blotting sheets. Then you need a semi dry electro blotting units and you need a reagents for performing the electrophoresis which we, uh, which we have discussed in the previous lectures. Then you need the primary antibody in this case we are using the GFP as a, uh, as a uh, tag so in this case you need the anti GFP antibodies. Then you need uh, anti rabbit IgG HRP which is actually against the primary antibodies and then you need a developing reagents. So in the step 1 you are going to prepare the sample which means you are going to prepare the lysate and preparation of lysate is also depends upon the sample what you are going to use. If it is a tissue for example if you are using a tissue instead of cell then you first you have to do is you from the tissue you have to get the cells. So how to do that for a solid tissue such as the tumor or the whole liver brain it is first mechanically being broken down into the individual cells using a blender or homogenizer or by sonication. Once the individual cells are obtained it will be processed as we discussed for the cells. If you have a individual cells then you are incubated with the lysis buffer containing the detergent along with the proteases and the phosphatase inhibitor cocktail to protect the sample from the degradations. 
So once the, your sample is ready in the lysis buffer, then you in the second step you are going to resolve the samples onto the SDS page. The so sample was resolved onto the SDS page as we discussed in the previous lecture. Then what you do is in the step 3 you transfer the uh, these uh, protein onto a blotting membrane. The transfer is actually a very very crucial as well as the important step. So transfer is being done by following a uh, multiple steps. In the step 1 what you have to do is before you start the transfer you have to prepare the membrane. So you have to cut the membrane of the same size as your gel. So for example if you have gel of 10 by 7 then you um, cut the membrane of the same size, then suppose you are using the nitrocellulose membrane, then in that case you place the membrane in the transfer buffer and observe that the liquid is going to wet the membrane, which means the membrane is going to be uh, wet by using the transfer buffer. The areas appear as a white spot needs special consideration. So when you do that, what you happen is sometime you will see a white color spots. So these white color spots are the places where the membrane has not taken up your transfer buffer. You have to incubate these membrane for longer period of time so that these white spots also going to be give you a wet feeling which means the complete membrane should be of uniform color or uniform uh, appearances because all these white color spots are going to give you a non-specific binding of antibodies and they may give you some different types of artifacts. If you are using a PVDF membrane, the PVDF membranes are actually the hydrophobic membrane, so uh, which means they do not like the water. So hydrophobic membranes are need to be converted into the hydrophilic uh, uh, gel, uh, hydrophilic membrane so that it will actually catch up your protein and bind your protein. How to do that? You immerse the membrane into the 100 percent methanol for 15 to 30 minutes. Then you remove the methanol and submerge the membrane into a transfer buffer for additional half an hour. That actually is going to make the uh, membrane wettable by the uh, transfer buffer and that actually will allow the transfer of the protein onto this membrane. Otherwise, if you use the PVDF membrane without this particular step, the mem PVDF membrane is not going to bind the protein or even if it binds the protein, it may not be. Uh, uh, evenly distributed. Now once this is done then you have to as uh, assemble the transfer cassettes. You remove the stacking gel from the page and incubate the gel in the transfer buffer. So the your gel is uh, having the stacking gel. You do not need a stacking gel because there is no protein or there is no band present in the stacking gel. So that you have to cut and then you take only the resolving gels. Uh, place a pair of blotting sheets already uh, you are uh, which are already wet with the transfer buffer onto the anode plate. So uh, usually this plate is black colored. So your anode gel anode plate is black in color. You put the two sheets of blotting sheets. Then you place the transfer buffer onto the top of blotting sheets and remove the trapped air bubble by by a rolling test tube or the glass rods. Then you place the SDS page or the gel onto the membrane and gently remove the trapped air bubble by rolling the test tube or the glass rods. So in the on the top of these blotting sheets first you put the membrane, then you remove the, the, then you remove the uh, bubbles which are present in between, then you put your SDS page, then you put another sheet of blotting sheets and you remove the, uh, uh, the trapped air or trapped bubbles. Place another blotting sheets uh, on the top of the and remove the air bubble by rolling test tube or the glass rod. Finally, keep the cathode plates, usually it is red color. So then you put the cathode plate and then you, uh, the, uh, you tied the transfer cassette by putting the four screws. So every cassette has screws on all the corners and that you have to tie up so that the whole cassette is going to be one unit and that is how you can just submerge this into the transfer tank. Uh, so this is what is uh, you have first you prepare your transfer buffers so you put the filter paper into the different uh, trays so that they will be get wet and then first you put the filter papers onto the uh, this uh, uh, and, and anode plates, then you put the nitrocellulose membrane, then you put the gel and 
then you put the filter paper and in between you have to use a rolling pens so that you can remove the oxy, uh, air in between because if the air is present that area the protein is not going to be transferred onto the nitrosome membrane especially the air should not be present between the membrane as well as the gel. Then you remove the stacking gel from the page and incubate the gel. Uh, okay. And once you are done it, you put the cathode and then you tie up with the help of the screw and then you connect this to the power pack and you run the things on 100 volts for, uh, uh, so then you transfer the protein from the gel to the membrane, place the transfer cassette in the tank filled with the transfer buffer, connect the transfer apparatus to the power supply unit and supply the 100 volts for 1 hour. After the transfer, you dis disassemble, so you remove the screws and uh, and carefully remove the transfer membrane and check the protein transfer by a dye which is called as the poncho S. Use a pencil. So, uh, once you got the things, you will going to see all these bands uh, with the help of poncho. Then what you can do is you can use a pencil to mark the markers. So, you can put a marker, you can label the things like 1 and 2 with the help of a uh, 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 graphite pencil and that actually will allow you uh, subsequently to know which one is the lane 1 and which one is the lane 2. Uh, now in the step 4, once your transfer is over, you wash the membrane with distilled water to remove any remaining poncho S, put the membrane in blocking buffer containing 5 percent skim milk if you are detecting the cytosolic protein, if you are detecting the phosphorylated protein, then you can add the 5 percent fat free BSA because the skim milk also contains lot of alkaline phosphatase and some other kind of uh, phosphate molecules. So, if you use the uh, milk as a blocking agent, you may get a artifacts in the detection of phosphorylated proteins. Uh, then step 5, you are going to do the probing. So, probing can be done in the in the western blotting probing can be done in two different ways a two step probing or the single step probing. In the two step probing uh, membrane is first probed with the primary antibodies to recognize the protein of interest. This protein primary antibodies can be generated against the protein of your interest or it this primary antibodies could be against the uh, tag which you are going to use. In this case, we are using the anti-GFP antibodies. So, you can use the anti-GFP antibodies which you can easily purchase from a commercial vendors. Uh, and then followed by that, you also have to put the uh, secondary antibodies which is will be against directed against the primary antibodies. So, the secondary antibody is not going to detect the antigen or it is not going to detect the protein or the tag. It is only going to detect the wherever the primary antibody has bound and we have discussed in the past that why we use the two, uh, two step probing because the two step probing actually amplifies the signal several folds. Once and the secondary antibodies are normally contains HRP or the alkaline phosphatase as an enzyme which you can use for uh, running the reactions. Sometime it also been coupled with the fluorescent dye. Then the washed membrane is incubated with the secondary antibody with an appropriate dilution for 1 hour at room temperature. Membrane is washed with the buffer containing non-ionic detergent and developed. Use of two antibodies increases the sensitivity as well as the flexibility to plan the multiple probing. For example, if you are having the five membranes, so what you can do is you can add the different, 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 different primary antibodies and then you can club them or you can plan the things properly because you have two steps. Whereas in the single step, you have to do it very, uh, you have to. Uh, first of all, it is you are going to compromise with the sensitivity. The secondly, you have to compromise with the flexibility that you cannot have the two antibodies. In the one step probing, uh, you add the primary antibody which actually is coupled with the enzyme or the fluorescent label for detection. The one step probing is not very popular or very common. Uh, then what you do is you develop the blot. So, there are multiple ways to develop the blot to detect the protein based on the membrane. You have the chromogenic uh, substrates for its, uh, which are uh, based on the HRPs such as the 4-chloronephthol uh, or DAB or TMB. Uh, these are the uh, reactions. So, if you use the 4-chloronephthol, it, it will form a purple color precipitate. 
if you use the dab it is going to form a dark brown precipitate and if you use the TMB it is going to form the dark purple stain onto the membrane. Similarly you can have the alkaline phosphatase so you have the substrate which is called BCIP and BT and the BCPI hydrolysis produce indigo precipitate after excitation with NVT. So, these are the chlor chlorometric or the chloromergenic substrates. You have the luminescent substrate also. For example, for HRP you can use the luminol or the H2O2 and that actually is going to be oxidized to give you a light and that you can detect in the chemiluminescence system. Similarly, you have the alkaline phosphatase which you can use for substituted 1,2-dioxane uh, phosphate and that actually also going to give you uh, light which you can detect into the chemiluminescent system. So, you have the colorimetric detections which is actually of these substrates or you have the chemiluminescence detections. The different chemiluminescent reagents are given in the table. You transfer the membrane onto the chemiluminescent reagent, soak the membrane for 30 seconds to 5 minutes drain off the reagent and wrap the membrane into the plastic wrap, place it in a film cassette and expose the membrane for few seconds to several hours. Then you also have the fluorescent detection. In the secondary antibody labeled with the fluorescent dye, you can capture that into a specific scanners like you can use for uh, different types of scanners to detect the different dyes which are uh, for the like Psi 3, Psi 5 or some other uh, color dyes and that those specialized sp scanner can be used. So, this is what all about the western blotting where you have the gel, then you transfer it onto the nitrocellulose membrane, then you incubate it with the primary antibodies, then you, you wash it uh, with the excess wash, then you add the secondary antibodies and then ultimately you develop the secondary uh, the blot with the help of different types of substrates either it is colorimetric substrate such as dab or you have the chemiluminescent substrate or the fluorescent substrates so all these steps are uh, very very uh, uh, simple they are very easy to perform and but they require a uh, precautions and they require a, a, a simple training to do a western blotting in your laboratory so, to uh, show you a small demo uh, or to how to perform the western blotting, we have performed all these steps in our laboratory and the Banesh is going to show you all these steps so that you will be not only going, get, going to get the theoretical knowledge, you also going to get the uh, practical knowledge about how to set up these cassettes and how to, how to transfer the gels, how to do a primary incubations secondary incubations and how to develop the blots and once you develop the blot you are going to get the chemiluminescent reagents, uh, chemiluminescent signal and uh, that actually also can be evaluated using the different types of image analysis software as well. In this video we will demonstrate you how to do a western blot and uh, uh, how to analyze the result using ACL electrochemiluminescence substrate. So, here what we will do, we have to run gel first, then we will transfer. The transfer method, how to do the transfer, we will show in this video. In previous video, we have already shown that uh, how to run, how to prepare a SDS page gel and how to run protein samples. So, in this video, particularly we are interested in uh, uh, factors associated with the western blotting. For doing western blot, we need membrane and uh, transfer buffer and uh, the transfer medium. Uh, this one is we used to transfer this gel to membrane. So, here membrane can be two kind. One is nitrocellulose which has low uh, protein binding efficiency and hydrophilic in nature. Another membrane is PVDF. This is hydrophobic membrane and uh, higher protein binding capacity. So, the processing for uh, western blood is different from different for uh, nitrocellulose and PVDF. If you are using PVDF membrane, we have to take, we have to cut the part. Either if you have ready-made uh, pre-cut uh, pre-cut bloods, then no need. If you have, if you are taking from a 
bundle you have to cut precisely how many wells you want so after that you have to label front on the blot where that front side can be used for transferring the protein and that can be used in previous step uh, further steps also like uh, uh, antibody incubation so here for uh, if you want to use pvdf membrane you have to charge with the methanol so since the pvdf is a hydrophobic membrane you cannot directly uh, transfer the transfer in the aqueous medium first you have to keep in uh, methanol for at least 20 minutes so after this can be called as charging so after this we will use that for uh, transfer so this is pre soaked in methanol and uh, equilibrated, equilibrated in uh, transfer buffer so here by doing uh, uh, transfer we need to consider few things the buffer always should be in chilled condition otherwise during this transfer at high voltage it will generate high temperatures so that may degrade your protein or decrease the efficiency of the transfer that's why we need to keep the buffer always in chilled condition and uh, let's start the procedure so uh, we need a pre-run gel so we already finished the gel running in addition to that we also need sponges which will give cushion to the uh, gel so that uh, gel may not uh, destroyed during the transfer so this is this is the cassette we will use for the uh, transfer so this is uh, negative side of cassette and this is the positive side so we are going to keep gel on negative side and positive side the blood uh, membrane so when we when we apply voltage from this side to this side the negative protein it will be transferred it will be moved to positive side uh, positive side and it will be uh, captured in the uh, membrane so first for doing that these sponges we need to keep and also this uh, maybe give some uh, non specific uh, binding to membrane so what we will do we will put blotting sheets on top of this so after this you have to remove air bubbles if any present so once uh, you inserted the blotting sheet then you have to keep your gel so here we, we have to remember that gel after finishing the uh, SDS phase running you have to keep in uh, transfer buffer so that it will give identical condition or equilibration kind of thing during transfer so that uh, protein transfer may be easy so this is the gel and keeping on the negative side so after that we have to overlay with the membrane next we have to remove any air bubbles if present we have to overlay with another blotting sheet and remove the air bubbles each and every time when you introduce something you have to remove air bubbles so this is the final sheet 
so this is the positive side of the cassette just have to keep like this these are the screws we have to tighten it up then only the contact between the gel and the membrane will be sufficient to uh, get transferred first you don't tight initially you just keep and after that press the positive side of the cassette then tighten the screws so all these things should be done in the transfer buffer only unless specified so this is the chilled transfer buffer now we are going to do transfer pour sufficient buffer keep uh, this ice pack also if the chilling is not sufficient then uh, there may be heat generation so in order to prevent that we will use this ice pack so this will keep uh, the buffer cool till the transfer end of the transfer so uh, once that is over you directly take out the cassette and keep if there is a buffer insufficiency you can add on top of that make sure that uh, the cassette completely submerged so that the transfer will be proper and uh, there is no air bubbles so once the setup is over now you can transfer Now transfer is going so how much voltage we need to give it depends on uh, uh, transfer to transfer it varies generally in our lab we will give at least uh, 2 hours of transfer at uh, 120 volts which is sufficient to uh, transfer even low molecular weight proteins also but uh, from instrument to instrument also it varies we need you needed to optimize before uh, doing uh, transfer after two hours we have to uh, remove the blood and uh, incubate with the uh, blocking buffer so we i am going to stop here remove the cassette keep the net tray remove the screws properly gently remove the sponges take out the blood and keep it in blocking buffer in this condition we have to keep if you are keeping it room temperature it is for 2 hours at least if you are keeping in 4 degrees celsius you can keep overnight the blocking buffer contains skim milk uh, or bsa along with the queen 20 the western blood transfer it's all depends on the efficiency how precisely you are doing the transfer for example you should not use your bare hands while handling the blood or uh, gel so whatever the proteins present on uh, your fingers it will transfer into uh, gel or membrane which will give high background during development of the blood so always use gloves apart from that uh, while handling the instrument to make sure that there may be possibility of uh, 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 electricity the shock uh, may happen sometime so we have to that time also we need to use gloves and after uh, finishing uh, finishing the transfer you have to clean all the apparatus properly and dry it for the next time use after the blocking of the membrane we have to remove the membrane and incubate with the primary antibody without washing 
the main purpose of the blocking is that it will occupy non specific sites other than the respective protein so that when antibody comes it will bind to that specific protein and gives no nice so after this we will incubate with the primary antibody for uh, overnight at 4 degrees celsius then wash three times at least 15 minutes each with the uh, tbst buffer or pbst buffer and uh, again treat with incubate with the secondary antibody suitable secondary antibody for uh, 5 hours at 4 degrees celsius or 2 hours at uh, 3 hours at room temperature after that we need to wash properly at least 3 times then we will develop with the develop the blood with the electrochemical limits and substrate in earlier uh, western blood how to do western blood video we showed how to transfer the proteins to uh, membrane so uh, we are we incubated with the uh, primary antibody following secondary antibody and wash with the now here we show how to develop a blood for developing a blood we need chemical lumens and substrate in most of the commercially available kits luminar uh, luminal is the luminal is the one of the substrate we use for this purpose so luminal in presence of hydrogen peroxide and uh, peroxidase engine which present in the uh, secondary antibody uh, horse radius peroxidase conjugated secondary antibody this horse radius peroxidase converts luminal to uh, excited state luminal by deprotonating and oxidizing it so this product uh, this excited state product gradually uh, leaves the energy by releasing uh, lumens and photons. That light will be detected using this instrument. So, uh, these are the commercially available uh, chemical lumens and substrate uh, solutions. So, it is available from a wide range of companies. So we have to mix 1 is to 1 ratio. So we have to uh, take out the blood, drain the buffer whatever present properly so after that we keep blood in between uh, a plastic paper foils then we will take chemical luminescent substrate So after that, you have to slowly press and remove air bubbles. This is the tray we use it for uh, developing the blood. So we have to open the system properly align the uh, tray and then shift blood to the tail. Once it is over, you have to just close. Here we have to select application. We want bloods that is chemiluminescent and uh, what exposure want you have two options manual auto auto in auto two options are there optimal auto exposure rapid auto exposure we will choose optimal auto exposure so you can uh, enlarge the uh, blood also once it is over you just say so 
so this is the developed blood so as we can see uh, the bands the bands pattern so this is how we develop uh, western blood uh, through electrochemiluminescent substrate so in this video we demonstrated how to transfer uh, proteins to a blood and what are the precautions need to be taken while doing the western blood and also how to develop the blood and what is the laying principle behind the developing the blood so hope i hope this will help you to understand the uh, basic outlay mechanism of how western blood works so in this de uh, demo videos uh, the banesh has discussed different aspects of western blotting how to set up the cassettes how to perform the uh, how to perf how to blot the uh, gel from the from how to how to transfer the protein from the gel to the nitrocellulose membranes how to do the blocking and all other steps which are involved in western blotting which we have discussed in our lecture as well and i hope this demo could have been helpful for you to perform these experiment in your laboratory so with this we would like to conclude our lecture here and in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about how to characterize the product by using the different types of spectroscopy techniques thank you